Hi friends, how are you today? It's me again, I'm here. I hope you're having a wonderful day so far. If you are new here, hi, my name is Bailey Sarian and it's Monday, which means it's murder, mystery, and makeup Monday. That's my theme song. Don't know how we ended up with it, but we did and it's here. Every Monday I sit down and I talk about a true crime story that's been heavy on my noggin and I do my makeup at the same time. I'm here for you every Monday and I also upload on Saturdays as well. So I would suggest you hit that subscribe button, especially if you're interested in true crime and makeup because it's cool. So last week we talked about the Unabomber and his manifesto and it was, it was interesting, you know? Mm -hmm. I thought about writing him a letter. I might, but I don't know. I don't know how I feel, I don't know. Oh, 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 really quick. This is a side note. So I read my comments, right? As one does. And I've noticed, I've noticed a couple of comments that will say stuff like, this story was boring. I'm not impressed by today's upload. It's got me feeling some kind of way. I'm trying to think how to word this properly. Hear me out first. So when I talk about these stories, I understand that some of them are like, whoa, what, huh? Like very, what? And then some stories are more just kind of like straight to the point. There's not as many twists and turns. When I pick these stories, it just kind of interests me. Like you can think this video is boring or whatever. For you to comment that it's boring, not interesting, or that you're disappointed in my upload, it's just kind of weird to me. You need to remember that these are like real people we're talking about. And yes, I make light of certain situa situations and stuff, but maybe just keep that comment to yourself. I don't know. Like I don't, I just don't like those comments. They make me feel sad for the fact that we're so desensitized to um, these stories. It has to be so extreme in order to please you. I don't know, but think about it before you comment it is what I'm asking. These are real people and their lives have either ended or have been affected. Does that make sense? Also, I've seen comments saying that I look bored. I look like I'm not enjoying this anymore. And that made me feel bad as well because of course I wouldn't do this if I wasn't interested in it. I think what is happening is sometimes I film at night when I, cause it's like the only time I have. When I film at night, I do speak a little bit lower. I'm not as like animated and stuff because I live in an apartment. I share walls with people. And if it's late at night and s s the neighbor's sleeping upstairs, like I'm trying to just kind of like keep it down a notch <laughs> and just kind of tell the story. It's so frustrating living in an apartment because I always feel like I'm working on other people's time because it's such a loud neighborhood. And it's not my favorite to film at nighttime. It's really not, but sometimes it's my only option. So. I just had to say those two things. I forgot to put my piercing in, so let me do that. Okay, we've got the piercing in, so you know she's serious. And this week, the story was recommended to me by one of you guys. Um, shout out to Kaylin Shea 99 on Twitter. She sent this to me and it was really interesting and really kind of gross, to be honest as well. So, you know, that's right up my alley. And I thought, let's do it. So Barbara Daly, Barbara was born in Boston in 1922. I believe she was an only daughter. Um, I didn't read anything about her having siblings. So forgive me if I am wrong there, but I believe she was the only child. When she was 11 years old in 1933, her father actually committed suicide. He locked himself in the garage. He committed suicide by carbon monoxide poisoning from the exhaust. Barbara was the one that found him, which I couldn't even imagine how how that affects a poor child. Once he committed suicide, it was just her and her mother and they just waited for the life insurance payment to come through. Now this was like back in 1933. So I believe um, life insurance was different then. Like you could actually get life insurance if somebody committed suicide. Now I think if you commit suicide, you don't get life insurance. I could be wrong there. It might be a fixed amount or something, but which is so stupid, but that's, so yeah, they ended up collecting a good amount of money when the life insurance came through. Once Barbara's mother collected the life insurance policy, that's when the two of them, Barbara and her mother, they moved to New York City. That's when they took up a residence in the Delmonico Hotel in New York. Based off like articles I was looking at, it seems like the Delmonico Hotel was a pretty um, like elite 
Hotel. It's no longer there anymore. Trump actually purchased it in 2001 for like $115 million and turned it into the Trump Park Avenue. What I'm getting at is they must have had, they must have got a good amount of money in order to stay there. From my understanding, they were not wealthy, Barbara's family. And um, so that's kind of suspicious. Like, do you think the mom killed him? Now the two of them are living in New York City and Barbara is in her teenage years, in like her early 20s. She's thrown into the middle of the city and she becomes a prominent socialite. What is a socialite? A socialite is somebody who like is wealthy and is always at different parties and always invited to the latest and greatest. Those restaurants that you can't ever get into, a socialite will be there. It's just somebody who like networks. I don't know. Socialite, I will Google. So I Googled socialite and it says a person who is well known in fashionable society and is fond of social activities and entertainment, which like that could be any of us. Anyways, Barbara becomes a prominent socialite in New York City. When she was there, you see, Barbara would be named one of New York's 10 most beautiful girls. And from that, she gained regular modeling contracts with Vogue and Harper's Bazaar. Her social status and beauty constantly brought her invitations to high society parties, allowing her to date various wealthy admirers. Very highbrow, high class. Huh. She just like networked her way to the top baby. In her real life, she was actually suffering from a mental illness. Her mother also suffered from schizophrenia, but I couldn't really get that much clarification. Now this was a time when mental health was not really even talked about because if you were seeing a psychiatrist or anything, you were taken as somebody who's crazy. Am I saying that this is true? No, but this was a time when everybody thought that. She was also seeing a private patient psychiatrist. His name was Foster Kennedy, and uh, but she never mentioned it. She kept it a secret. She didn't tell anybody because if anybody knew, she would lose everything. Now, Barbara actually got invited to fly out to Hollywood for a screen test. She really wanted to be an actress. She just wanted to be famous. Hold on, why am I doing? Let me do liner off camera. Why do I try and do it on camera? I don't know. So while out in Los Angeles, Barbara did not get cast in a movie, but she actually left with a new friendship and that was from an actress or an aspiring actress named Cornelia Bakeland. Barbara met Cornelia and they really hit it off and they became friends and they started hanging out a lot. And then Cornelia introduced Barbara to her brother named Brooks. Now Brooks was actually working as a trainee pilot with the Royal Canadian Air Force. Now at first Barbara's like, oh, that's cool. Like he's cute, but like he flies planes. Now back then they didn't have Google. So they had to figure out shit on their own. You know, I'm not sure how exactly Barbara figures this out, but I think probably word of mouth, I'm assuming. But she finds out that Brooks, this guy, and Cornelia come from a very, very wealthy family. I mean, money you and I will never know. There's different types of rich, you know? There's the self-made millionaire, and then there's rich rich, which is old money, usually like the oil industry or the railroad company. Those people are like rich, rich. Anyway, she finds out that this family, rich, Brooks, this guy that she's like kind of interested, but in, not really. She finds out that his grandfather invented plastic. He invented it. He probably stole it from someone, but he's the one that like, you know, got that patent and everything. There was no plastic before this man. So the two of them, Brooks and Barbara, they're dating now, they're official. Barbara's just like, oh my God, he's the best thing ever. She's like, fuck yeah, I'm set for life, bitch. Come on, ask me to marry you. So as time goes on, allegedly, the relationship was pretty rocky from the start. They seem to always be bickering, fighting. You know, eventually I think Brooks is the one who was like, I'm really done with this and I want out of this relationship. And then good old Barb was like, well, guess what? I'm pregnant. Now she knew like that Brooks was just trying to get out of the relationship. Now here's the kicker. Here's the kicker. Barbara wasn't pregnant. 
Nay, nay. Barbara just didn't want this man to leave because then she would have to go back to work. But she didn't tell Brooks this until after they got married. They got married right away. You know, getting uh, pregnant before marriage is just frowned upon. This is, uh, you know, those times doing anything wrong. It was frowned upon. It was frowned upon to breathe. Just everything is frowned upon. So they quickly get married in California because Barbara's pregnant. We have to get married before anybody finds out that she's pregnant. They get married, boom. Barbara's like, oh, by the way, not pregnant. Of course, that leads to a really big fight. Brooks is really disappointed. It's fucked up. Barbara over here is just so happy because she sealed the deal. She's now Barbara Bakeland. And you know what that means? Money. She's now part of the family, Bakelite family. Bakelite is the, pl the plastic company that the family owned. So after the marriage, the couple had set up a home and luxury apartment in the Upper East Side of New York. And in this apartment, they held parties all the time. They would invite only the fancy and well-known wealthy people in the area. Come on over, we're gonna have a party, an extravagant dinner, just to kind of keep this socialite thing going. I honestly don't know why Brooks stayed with her after finding out she lied about being pregnant. Couldn't really find much information. Maybe she lied to him and said she lost the baby, I don't know. And maybe divorce would have been frowned upon. Now over time, Barbara in general became well known to, to everybody for her unstable personality. She had rude outbursts, not fun to hang out with. She was just rude. She was very rude to people. But again, it's a time where you can't get help. And if anyone knew she was seeing a psychiatrist, it would be, it would be done for her social light days. So it was also reported that Barbara was an alcoholic. She would get sloppy drunk. It was also said as time went on, her husband, Brooks, he had many affairs. I'm talking like a new girl a week. He just was constantly sleeping around. Whoopsie. Barbara actually did end up pregnant. For real, this time with Brooks' baby, she ended up giving birth to a little boy in August of 1946, and his name was Anthony Bakeland. They called him Tony for short. So every summer beginning in 1954 and then onward, the whole Bakeland family, they would pretty much do what a lot of rich people do. They have the luxury of having a home, well, many homes. So they had their main home like in New York and then they had another home, Spain, London, Paris. And then it just really depended on the season where they wanted to stay. Like it's cold, let's go stay in our summer house. Why pay for heating when you can just go somewhere warm, you know? <laughs> Am I right? Peasants. And then in 1960, the family decided, let's just go live in Paris. Something happened in New York. I think it was at a party, Barbara, I guess, had gotten really so sloppy, sloppy drunk and just was a mess, like embarrassed herself. So that's why they decided to go stay in Paris because they don't know about that little hiccup I had. Let's just go stay there and start over. While they're in Paris, Brooks, her husband, he had met another girl, English diplomat's daughter, and she was 15 years old. At this time, that wasn't a legal. <laughs> 15 sounds great. So he meets this girl, she's 15. He's like, wow, I love her. She's the love of my life. And Brooks is like, I'm gonna marry you. This is such a lifetime movie. So Brooks, it goes to his wife, Barbara, and he's like, hey, met this 15 year old, she's fire. I wanna be with her. I want out of this marriage. Here are the divorce papers, I want out. Now, like any of us would be, Barbara was traumatized. She was so upset. Plus she was jealous and bitter that he was going with a 15 year old, a much younger woman, lady, kid much younger kid and she was quote, better looking than her. And then that's when Barbara just lost it. Okay, she was like, my life is over, no more money. I love this man. So Barbara came up with this great idea. She's like, you know what? I'm gonna kill myself. So she tries to kill herself. It was more for show. Brooks is like, really Barb? She tried to kill herself, but it didn't work because she didn't really wanna die. She just wanted Brooks be scared and like stay with her. Brooks comes home, finds her. He's like, I'll break off the affair. I just wanna be with you, Barb. So Barbara ends up being fine and she gets what she wanted. Brooks is, breaks off this affair with the 15 year old and just wants to be with Barbara. As far as the relationship goes with their son, 
it's really not talked about much because it doesn't seem like there was much of a relationship. There was nannies taking care of Tony, Barbara just giving him whatever he wanted because she didn't really want to be a mother. So if she just gave him stuff and that was good enough. Poor Tony, this little kid, he's just growing up, super wealthy, but he really doesn't have parents around to take care of him. Pretty much ignored. Tony, the son, after the age of 18, he decides to kind of travel around and live in different areas than his family. Like he wants to be on his own. Plus they're wealthy. He can go wherever he wanted. And the parents didn't care, which is like the dream when you're a teenager. So Tony was like, I'm just gonna go through Europe to like different places and then kind of figure out where I'm gonna live. So then in 1967, Tony is now 20 years old. He decides to go live in Italy. And at this time, Tony ends up meeting a guy named Jake Cooper. And Jake Cooper was a bisexual Australian man. Now Jake would become a really close friend to Tony. Jake would be the one to introduce Tony to various different drugs. Tony's like, oh shit, this is cool, drugs. So Tony and Jake are getting pretty close. They're pretty much living together. You know, a little bit of time goes on. They're experimenting with drugs and stuff. And then Tony's like, I think I'm attracted to dudes and I'm gonna like be with this guy. So they ended up being in a romantic relationship together, the two of them, but they didn't tell anybody because again, this was a time when no, nay, nay. No. Barbara was still living in Paris while her son was having this relationship down in Italy. Word got back to Barbara that her son was in a relationship with a man. And Barbara was like, oh, hell no, he is not. So Barbara was like, I'm gonna drive down there <laughs> and I'm gonna go get him, bring him back, and we're gonna fix this. He will not make this family look bad. So Barbara drives down there to where her son's staying at, and she's like, get your shit, we are getting out of here right now. So Barbara actually wanted to set her son up with a young girl. Barbara firmly believed that Tony just didn't meet the right girl, and that's why he was gay. He needed a girl that he actually liked and he wouldn't be gay anymore. So Barbara hit up one of her friends. Her friend had a young Spanish daughter and her name was Sylvie. And pretty much Barbara was like, this is the girl you're gonna date. Like you're not dating a guy anymore. This is who you're dating, she's moving in. So the relationship was moving quite quickly. Sylvie, Barbara, Brooks, Tony, they were all living together. Barbara's plan actually backfired and she found out that her husband Brooks was sleeping and had a relationship with Sylvie. Yeah, shit, it's messy. So then in 1968, Brooks decided that he was just, again, once again, he was done with Barbara and her shit. He wanted to be with the Sylvie girl. So Brooks goes to Barb and tells her once again, like, I want out of this, I want to have this marriage. Luckily for Brooks, I guess, they ended up getting a divorce and Brooks ended up marrying Sylvie. And Tony tells Barbara that I'm gonna be with a guy. That's what I want. I like men. This time it just really set her off the rails. Like she was livid. Okay, look, Barbara was having a lot of affairs as well throughout her marriage. It wasn't just the Brooks guy. Uh, she was also engaging in some affairs. And I'm mentioning that because her thought process here really doesn't make sense. It's just different. <laughs> so Barbara was determined to fix her son. So she would hire prostitutes, force Tony to have sex with them. And like none of it was working. Barbara here was like, you know what? I've had many men tell me that my pussy is bomb. Maybe if I sleep with Tony, he'll be straight, eh? Her ego is that big. My vagina is that special that it will heal Tony of his gayness. Oh yes, this is what she thought. Barbara was alleged to have manipulated her son into having sex with her, which is absolutely disturbing. Now her son was really good looking, so I don't know if she was like actually attracted to him or what, but at the end of the day, that's still your son. So that is, and it said that during his young adulthood, Tony displayed signs of schizophrenia with paranoid tendencies and his erratic behavior caused concern. And then eventually he was diagnosed with schizophrenia. However, his 
father refused to allow him to be treated by a psychiatrist. He believed that it was immoral, it was against everything they believe in, and there's no way he's gonna get help. He's not schizophrenic, he just needs a nap. So when Barbara's having this relationship with him, having a sexual relationship with him, it's even worse because she's taking advantage of her son who is suffering from a mental illness that's going untreated and she's just like making everything worse with her selfish actions. Got tongue tied. So they're having a sexual relationship for a little bit of time. It's even said that Tony was seeing another guy and they were like at the house and then Barbara had a threesome with them. Barbara felt like she thought, if I have sex with my son, he's not going to be gay anymore. <laughs> But she did that. Here on October 17th, 1972, Tony ended up murdering Barb. Tony goes down into the kitchen and he grabs a kitchen knife. He went behind Barb, his mother, and he ended up stabbing her just a couple of times because his first stab almost killed her instantly. I think it was only like two times, but he stabs her and Barbara ends up dying. She was 50 years old at that time. Tony at this time was 25. So you see this story was pretty old and there wasn't that much information on it. So there's a lot of stuff I'm not really clear on. Like I'm not sure why police came to the scene. Who called? I'm not sure on that, but police do end up coming to the scene and they end up finding Barbara, she's, she's dead on the ground. And they also find Tony, he's still at the house. Police arrest him, they take him in and he confesses to the murder. He's like, yeah, I did that shit. He also goes on to say that Barbara was abusing him and he just couldn't take it anymore. So he went up and he killed her. He was gay. He also had mental health issues that were going untreated. And it was because his mother wasn't allowing him to be himself, but also was preventing him from getting more help as far as the mental illness goes. And she was abusing him. So he just had all this rage built up and he's like, I'm just gonna kill her. It's sad, but like at the same time, I'm kind of like, well, I don't really, it's like the Gypsy Rose story, remember? I mean, it's nothing like that, but it's kind of similar with Gypsy Rose. She wasn't sexually abused, but she was being abused. And then she just had somebody else kill her mom. There's a video on it, which I did, and I will link it down below if you wanna watch that one. But with this story, Barbara is abusing her son. He, the only way he thought he could get out was killing her. Do I think it's right? No, but I, I guess I'm sick. Don't come for me, but I kind of understand, I guess. Like I, I eh. you don't want to agree that, yeah, it was the only option, but sometimes it's like, dude, I don't know. Anyways, so he confesses to the murder. He gets charged with murder. But instead of going to prison, he was institutionalized at Broadmoor, which is a psychiatric hospital. And he was there until July 21st of 1980. He seems to be doing really well. And the doctors were like, you know what? He seems like he's doing, he's doing well. He's gotten better of this illness. I'm not sure again, what the thought process was. I read that a group of his friends had a petition to get him out, said like he was being abused and he shouldn't even be there. He's fine. But then I also read that that wasn't the case. So he did get out in 1980 and he was 33 years old at this time. And Tony's like, okay, I can't go with my dad because his dad, he doesn't want anything to do with him. So Tony was like, I can't go to my dad. He decides to fly to New York City to stay with his 87 year old maternal grandmother. So this was Barbara's mother. Now it seems that they also had a very toxic relationship and it only took six days after he was released. July 27th, he attacked his grandmother with a kitchen knife and he ended up stabbing her eight times and he broke several bones. It seemed he was very upset towards his grandmother for a couple of reasons. One, she didn't believe him that Barbara was sexually ab abusing him. And then also she didn't approve of him being gay. So then he was arrested by the New York City Police Department. He was charged with attempted murder and sent to prison. 
after eight months of being in prison, he actually was expecting to be released on bail at a court hearing March 20th, 1981. However, it didn't work out because there was a delay in the transfer of his medical records from the UK. So this made Tony extremely depressed. He went back to his cell and then he ended up putting a plastic bag over his head and he killed himself. There are a lot of people who do not believe that Tony killed himself. They believe that he was murdered, but there really isn't any proof to show that he was murdered. So I'm not really sure. I can't, I'm not really sure what I think either. Anyways, so that is the story about Barbara and Tony Brooks Bakeland. I know I was kind of all over the place with the story because again, there wasn't much information about a lot of things. Uh, there was actually a movie made based off of this story it's called Savage Grace and it stars like Julianne Moore I think it has plays Barbara and it kind of shows the relationship and what happened a lot of the family say that like it's a movie so a lot of parts are over exaggerated that's not very factual but it is a pretty good movie if you want to watch it I don't know yeah so that's the story sad gross and sad. So let me know your thoughts down below. I feel really bad for Tony. I mean, um, he had a pretty rough ass life and Barbara over here sucked balls. Like she sucked. It just goes to show you, you could be the richest little bitch in the world, but guess what, baby? Your life still probably sucks. Barbara was a piece of shit. I really don't know what else to say. <laughs> I hope you have a wonderful day today. You make good choices and let me know down below what you want me to talk about next week. I appreciate you guys so much for always sending suggestions. It means so much. Make good choices and please be safe out there, okay? I'll be seeing you guys later. Bye.